welcome everybody. Welcome to Yosemite Lakes Community Church. We're so glad you're here. Did everybody get their sign? Well, you probably didn't because I told you only if you live on a main street, busy street, but we changed that. We have about 10 signs left. So it doesn't matter where you live, grab a sign because your neighbor needs to see it. Okay? They're in a box right up front, right there. So let me see 10 hands right now who's going to grab a sign. One, two, three, four, five, six, Behind seven, you. eight, nine. Behind you. Ten. Perfect. Awesome. I love it. That's mine. Don't take that. Well, welcome, everybody. Are you happy? It's a good day. It's beautiful weather. It's a great day to weed eat. It's a good day to be in God's house, and we're so glad you're here. For all of you who are watching online, we welcome you as well. If you are new to our church, you are given a bulletin, and in that bulletin are a couple of things. But the most important thing is this little tear out on the side. Fill it out and tear it out. We want to get to know you. We want to know if there's a need that we can help meet in any way that we can come alongside you and help your journey with Christ. Um, fill it out. Put it in the baskets. We have offering baskets at the doors. And... Um, yeah, we're just glad you're here. We, we really are. We're, we're a growing church, and we believe that God is, is continuing to do mighty, powerful things through our ministry here. We're giving our all to Jesus, and he's going to be coming back soon. Amen. So we want to take a bunch of people with us. If you look on the back of your hot sheet, there's a few announcements. Um, today, after this service, is our congregational meeting. You're welcome to be here. If you're a member, you're, you're, you're going to be voting on um, one additional item with our solar project that we already approved um, regarding the financing. So please be here. And if you don't know what that is and you want to just listen in, come on and listen in and, and so that you are aware of what's going on in our church. And then also, Johnny still needs help in the Ignite ministry, our children's ministry. Kids just keep coming out of the woodworks. They're coming out of holes in the ground and everything else. And he needs help. He needs volunteers and people who love children. And if you don't love children, he can find something for you. <laughs> or it might change your heart and you might grow to love children. So um, go see Johnny outside at the ministry tent and let him know you want to help him because you won't regret it. It's a powerful ministry, and God's doing phenomenal things in that ministry. Um, we get to hear God's word today. That's a big deal. So excited about that. And then right now, we're going to worship Jesus. We're going to get to worship Jesus. Man, that's exciting. It's like a preliminary. It's like a, it's like a trailer to the real thing when we get there. And it's so good. So Jason and his team is going to lead us and... And so right now, let's, um, I, do, I use this term, it's a Christianese term, let's quiet our hearts, you know. And that means be still and, and, and take all your distractions away and let's go before the Lord and, and let's pray right now, okay? So Father, we come before you and we, um, we came in with, Maybe concerns and worries about life. Maybe we rushed here. But Lord, as we just take a deep breath and we breathe in your spirit, Lord, that we would um, be mindful that we're in your house today and we're here to worship you. We're here to, um, to give you our praise and our glory for all the good things you do in our life. No matter what life throws at us, you are there to catch it. You will be there with us. You will never leave us. You'll never forsake us. And you will continue to meet our needs no matter what. We pray over um, hearts today that they would be full by the time they leave, that they would feel your presence, your love, your mercy, your grace, your goodness. We ask, Lord, that you would um, take the tithes and offerings that are brought into the house today and that you would use them to further your kingdom. We ask, Lord, that you would be honored by our songs of worship and 
songs from the heart and that you would do something in our heart, that you would take away the sin, the things that weigh us down, things that hold us up, our worries, our concerns, the things we have no control over, and we yield them to you. And we ask, Lord, that you would change us today, that we would leave different people energized, enthused about the things that you're enthused about, burdened about the things that burden you, and that you would give us something to, to take away that we can go do what you've asked us to do, and that's change the world. We love you, Jesus. We praise your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor John. Well, good morning. Good morning to our online church who are so faithful to show up each week and worship with us. We're so glad you're here. We do have Easter Sunday coming up in uh, two weeks from today, and so we're excited about that. And on Easter Sunday, we're going to have three services. Uh, Mike and Renee Brogdon right here uh, have offered for us to have um, our sunrise service this year at their house. So that's up at the top of John Muir, a fairly similar place to where we've been before in rough area. Um, and we will get you uh, the address to that, or you could call the church office, and we will have signs uh, posted starting next week on the roadway to direct you up there. But that'll be at probably uh, 6.30 or 7.00. We'll have to figure out when that will start. Um, is it, have we had official 6.30? So bright and early, but it's, gonna, it's always fun to get up with the, the sun and uh, worship the risen sun. Amen. So that'll be fun. And then we'll have our, our nine o'clock and our 11 o'clock service as well. And so hopefully you're planning on being here and uh, celebrating the resurrection with us um, on Easter Sunday, as it will be a, a wonderful celebration. And also next Sunday is Palm Sunday. So a lot of good things coming up, beautiful weather and God is good. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. And we are going to sing about God's goodness and his love for us and what he did.
son for you and for me he paid our price he paid our debt thank you Lord thank you for your love I searched the world Treasures of faith are never enough. You came along. Now pull me back together. Every desire is not satisfied. Let's go. 
Sing it to the Lord. Tell him, tell him nothing is better than you. Nothing, God, in this world. Well, there's nothing better than you. Shout it to the Lord. Better than you. Well, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Well, there's nothing. No one's life was ever changed by reading the works of Charles Darwin, Lord. But your holy word changes lives. It's changed me, Lord. There's nothing more powerful than a testimony of a life changed because no one can deny it. Hopefully the world sees it, but even not, if you know you've been changed, you know you're changed. Amen? You begin to think differently and see things differently and have different motivations. And the Lord, if we spend time with him, he gives us the desires of our heart. He's not a genie that does what we want. He changes our hearts to be in alignment with his desires. And there's no better place to be because there's nothing better than him. Amen? Nothing better than you, Lord. We were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a grave
Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born It's just the beginning, as Pastor John said, Lord, that we are going to praise you, Lord. We're going to praise you for all eternity. We're going to lift you up. You are so worthy, Lord. We're going to remember what you did for us, Lord. And like never before, we're going to see who you are in a way that will just elicit praise, Lord, from all creation. The most natural thing in the world in your presence is to fall on our knees, fall on our face, and worship you, Lord. It's our proper posture before the King of Kings. Every king will bow. Lord, when we get to heaven, we'll be given a crown, Lord, the Bible teaches us. And we know that we will come and we will lay that at your feet because it will pale in comparison. We will lay everything down at your feet, Lord, because we know that you've done it all and you are worthy of all. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. And Lord, we pray this morning. You would remove anything that could distract us from the message this morning and all that you have for us. I pray that you would anoint Pastor Michael, Lord. Speak through him, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, from your holy word, Lord, right to our hearts, your holy people. And we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Children are now dismissed to our children's service. Thank you, teachers and all who work with our kids. Oh, gosh, there's a lot of them today. It's great, fabulous. Yeah, amen. You know, I, speaking of that, I, I should probably let Pastor Johnny uh, expound on this a little bit at some point, but I don't know if you know this, but our Wednesday night program has reignited. It's called Ignite, and uh, so... We, I think this, it's the, this has been the third or maybe the fourth week. Anyway, the first week we started with just over 50. Last week, I think we were over 60. And, and for a startup, I think that's great. We were kind of thinking maybe we'd start with 20 or something. You know, you just had some figure in mind. And, and I think Johnny was wise to sort of over-prepare for it because we just had a, a, a more, more kids than we really thought. And I just think kids are ready for something. They've just been bottled up for a year. And I think their parents are pretty ready too, so... <laughs> anyway, it's great, and, and the Lord has blessed us, and I, I just think we've seen it over and over again in one form or another. The Lord has blessed us this year. In a year when so many churches have shut their doors and, and, and not reopened, 
um, in a year when, when businesses have closed and, you know, just a lot of sad things have happened. What we've seen this year is God blessing us. Yes, we've been under some restrictions, but God has really, really blessed this church, which shows that his hand is upon us. And, and that means we have to step up and, and be faithful to what he's given. So anyway, uh, I, I think we can all rejoice in that together. We're going to look today at Ephesians chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles and want to turn there, you can, you can do that. Um, there's too much in that one chapter for me to put it up all on the screen. So we'll just read it along together. And remember that, that Ephesians gives us the big picture of our redemption. That's one of the nice things about that book. It's, it's kind of compact. And it gives us the big overview of, of who we are and, and what we have in Christ. So let's get a... Uh, a quick running start in this. We're going to be talking about shining in life and in marriage in particular in Ephesians chapter 5. But chapter 1 is that overview of who we are, what we've been given. Uh, I think sometimes we fail to see all that we are in Christ. We, we just take, we understand so little about it. And, and sometimes we, we just fail to take advantage of everything that God has has provided for us. So chapter one reminds us of that. Chapter two does tell us we were, we were lost. We were incapable of saving ourselves. We had nothing to offer God. And yet God, because he's gracious, saved us and, and did everything necessary to redeem us and then provided us with the means by which we can walk in that grace and serve him. Chapter three uh, is that, pa is that, uh, that passage that Pastor John preached a couple of weeks ago in which Paul gives that eloquent prayer of how we can more deeply experience the power and presence of God in our lives. And then last week, chapter four talked about kind of what that looks like, what the, the fullness of the Christ life as we live day to day. So this week, the, the key verse in my opinion, I'm sure others might disagree with that, but my, my opinion is that the key verse in chapter five is verse eight. It says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. So let's take that apart. I believe that's the central theme of this chapter as we shine in life and marriage. Now, what, what does walking in the light look like in daily life? And I, I think we need to ask that question. The, the, the Bible gives us the instructions on how to do that, but it also gives these big commands so let your light shine, walk in light. Okay, that, that sounds so good, but what do I do? What, what, what steps do I take to shine for the Lord? What does that look like? What will people see if I do that? And so we're gonna see that Paul does describe that in, in this chapter. So let's begin by reading verse one through seven, where it says, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. And live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be, partake, be, do not be partners with them. So, I mean, there's a lot right there. That's a sermon in itself, I understand, but we're going to do it a whole chapter. That's, that's what we're doing in this series. So the first section of what a shining life looks like is that it's a loving life. It's a life full of love. It's, it's, it's love modeled on Christ's love. And it, it even explains what Christ loved us like. It says he loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In other words, Jesus showed love in sacrificing himself, in, in, in dying for us, in not just dying, but dying an excruciating physical death and dying a death that was spiritually unimaginable because, because in his suffering, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
He was all alone. And it's unimaginable what that must have been like. He did that for us. I mean, I, why? My question is, why? It, well, there was nothing in us that would prompt someone to do something like that because we were lost in sin and it was his grace and his love that prompted him to do that so that we could be redeemed and that we could be with him forever and that he could make us into something wonderful. That's mind-blowing. And we are to live a life that reflects that. And we'll talk about some of the, the practical uh, steps that come from that in just a minute. But it's interesting that just after he talks about living a life of love, he contrasts that with sensuality. Now, why would he do that? You know, I've often said English is such a rich language. We have so many word choices in English. And that's, there are historical reasons for why that's true. But we have, we have, we usually can, you can, you can give shades of meaning in English by choosing different words that mean almost the same thing. But apparently when it comes to love, we're very poor because we got that one word to talk about a lot of different things. Oh, I know there's affection and, you know, other things like that. But we use this word love for all kinds of things. I love chocolate. I love my wife. You know, I, you, know you can talk about I love going on vacation. We use that word love for so many things. It, it, it's kind of watered down. And, and I think, you know, in some ways, the ancient world confused the concepts as well. I don't know if you've ever seen on YouTube or maybe in a book or something, you know, Pompeii was, was covered with ash by Mount Vesuvius in, I think it was 79 AD or something like that. It was right after the time of Christ. And so what you have in Pompeii and the neighbor, neighboring city of Herculaneum, you have an entire Roman city almost preserved intact. It was just buried under this volcanic ash. And so everything that was there was just still there when they dug it up. And they've been digging it up now for 100 years. They don't, they don't have it all dug up, but it's a, a lot of what they found is that you find a snapshot of what Roman life was like during that first century. So it's very revealing. And one of the things about it is the Romans had sex on their mind a lot. Because some of the stuff that you still see painted on the walls, we wouldn't permit that in public today. It's pornographic what you see on some of the wall paintings there. I mean, you know, you're looking at, oh, this is interesting, and you're going, my gosh. That was what you saw when you, when you went to that, that city, or at least that part of the city. And I think it's important that we recognize that Paul had to, had to make it clear what he meant when he said that we are to live a life of love, that it's not sensuality, that, that immorality has no place among God's people. That not even a, it says not even a hint of it, not even a whisper of it. We, we shouldn't have any you know, little playing around with that sort of thing in our lives. Um, and, and he mentions greed. Uh, somehow, somehow greed in, in, in Paul's mind, and obviously in the Holy Spirit's mind, greed is on the same level as immorality, that somehow that this desire to always have more and always, always uh, do whatever it takes to get more money, more things in our lives, that, that a greedy person will say, you know, I want more, and if you're in my way, too bad, I'm running over you. I'll even, I'll even hurt you if I need to, to get what I want. That's greed. Doesn't mean that you can't nice, like nice things. It does mean that you can't be so greedy, can't want them so much that you're greedy for them and will do almost anything to get them. The Apostle Paul says here that that's the same as idolatry. It becomes your God. Getting stuff becomes your God. And so immorality and greed are to be absolutely no place in the Christian life. Notice he also says no fleshly talk, no coarse joking. I'm sure we've all been in this situation. And I remember it in, you know, in high school, it's pretty prevalent, at least among guys it is. And, and uh, you know, in the workplace and, you know, other, other situations where you've got a mixed crowd of people. And you know how it is, you say something innocent and then there's somebody in the crowd that's got to turn that into something sexual. You know, they, they take some comment that you make and they turn it around and you're thinking, well, you know, that, you may think that's funny, but that tells me what's on your mind. Because it wasn't in my mind when I said it. But they've got to turn it that way. And so that kind of coarse joking and, and, and sexual talk 
reveals more about what's in a person's mind. And, and I think we're forbidden, one of the reasons we're forbidden is that it, we, we've got to purge our minds of that sort of thing all the time. And so, you know, it tells us in, in Romans that we are to be renewed in our minds. Well, how do we do that? By replacing what was already in there with this. By replacing the, the, the things that, dis, that, that displease God with things that please him. And so these are some of the things that he talks about that, that go along with a loving life. Now let's talk about a righteous life. Pick it up in verse 8. It says, For you were once darkness, but now are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Leave it there for just a minute. A righteous life is what it looks like if you shine for the Lord. Now, it mentions three things right off the, off the bat in this little portion of Scripture. It mentions goodness, righteousness, and truth. So I did a little word study on, on the first two of these because goodness really means, the, the word used for goodness there really means kindness. It really means the kind of goodness in which you are thinking about other people's needs. You know, we've all received kind acts from other people, and it, it, it touches your heart when that happens. You know, maybe you're, you're a guest at somebody's house, and they say, oh, would you like a cup of coffee, or would you like a drink? And you maybe hadn't even thought of that yet yourself, but they anticipated that that might be something that you would enjoy. Or, um, hey, can I give you my seat? You know, everybody's standing on a bus. Can I give you my seat? That's a kind thing to do. We're, we're very touched by kindness, and that's what that word really means, is that you're, you're good in the sense that you anticipate something that might benefit or bless somebody else. So a righteous life is seen in that kind of anticipating of something I can do to make your life better. Righteousness simply means justice. The word is dikaios in Greek. It just means what's right, what's fitting, what's appropriate for the situation. Righteousness is fitting. It's, it's, what's, it's what's right given the situation. And we are to be people who live in a way that is appropriate and fitting for all occasions. And then, of course, truth. I don't think I need to explain that as much. But, but truth is all about saying things as they actually are. It doesn't mean that you hurt people with truth because you can do that. But it does mean that you, you never try to say things that portray things as they are not really in, in reality. So we speak the truth. We, of course, we speak the truth in love. But we are always trying to match our words with what actually is the reality of the situation. And then it says something very interesting, at least to me. It says, um, find what pleases the Lord. Well, you think, well, that's a no-brainer. This book tells us what pleases the Lord, right? I mean, you know, just read the Bible and it'll tell you what, what pleases the Lord. But he's saying here that in some sense, there's something about how we live our lives that we, we sort of experiment or we... We try different things to find out what pleases the Lord. So what, what do I mean by that? Here's what I think the Apostle Paul is saying. Certainly there are things that everybody can do, all Christians can do that are in the Bible that we know please the Lord. But there are some things that I can do to please the Lord that he's not calling you to do. And there are some things that he's calling you to do to please him that he would not call me to do. And that has a lot to do with our spiritual gifts. It has a lot to do with the particular opportunities and networks of people that we have in our lives that he's calling us to do things that really make him smile. So have you ever been in the experience where you know, you're, you've had an opportunity to serve the Lord in some way or other? Maybe it's through some program or ministry that the church is doing or, or maybe you're with some other organization that's serving the Lord or, or maybe it's just in your own life. 
and you, you recognize that you have the ability to do something for the Lord, and you do it. You use your spiritual gifting. You take advantage of the opportunities, and, and you find joy in doing that. I think that tells you that you have just made God smile. You have just pleased him. Think about that movie, Chariots of Fire, way, way back in, what was it, the 80s when that came out? And you remember it was all about runners and there was one runner that was a believer and how he, you know, he was the fastest guy, Eric Little, and he broke all the records and all that sort of thing. And, and his sister was very concerned that his running was taking him away from his Christian service. And he, sa he said to her, but, but when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Well, I think in some sense, we can feel God's pleasure when we do things that are according to how he has called us, gifted us, and resourced us, and we do it wholeheartedly, God just laughs in pleasure. And I think that's what he's talking about there. And it's not something that we can, you know, find a verse in the Bible that tells you in those circumstances you have to do this. It's all about you and your individual walk with the Lord and, and pleasing him on that level. It also says expose darkness, that a, a light that shines for the Lord exposes darkness. What does that mean? It means that you are a living representative, a model of what it looks like to walk with Jesus Christ. Nobody's expecting you to be perfect, but we are expecting you to be authentic and consistent. And, and more and more, I think, as, as the days unfold before us, we are going to have opportunities to expose darkness simply by being who we are. You know, what, what happens when you, when you walk into a dark room and flick on the light switch? There's no more darkness. The light takes over. And that's the, the properties of light. Light tends to be very obvious, and it tends to drive darkness away. And I think what we've been seeing, and I'm not going to go into detail here, but I think more and more we're going to be seeing that there are things, there are dark things that have been going on in our world that have been hidden for a long time. And now we're going to see, unfortunately, we're going to see some of, of what that was. And we have an opportunity in the midst of that to portray righteousness and goodness and truth and all of those things, love and joy and peace and all of the good things that God has given to us and poured into our lives, it is our opportunity to shine for the Lord so that people say, well, this is horrible. What's the alternative? Oh, I want to be like that person. I want to be like those people at Yosemite Lakes Community Church. And it's a time for Christians to stand up as never before. Now, we have to talk about something um, because there's this, there's this verse, part of verse 14 is just sort of dropped in there. It says, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. In Greek, it's egeri ho kafudon, kai anasta ek tonekron kai epuphisei ha Christos. My Greek is not the greatest, but that's what it looks like with English letters. And what it says is, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. That is not a quote from the Old Testament. Lots of times the New Testament will quote the Old Testament, but this is not. This is evidently a piece of a Christian song that was popular at the time, or maybe it's a slogan that was used as people proclaimed Christ. I mean, you can almost picture somebody standing up in a marketplace to proclaim the gospel, and they said the words, wake up, O sleepers, rise from the dead, Christ will shine on you, and then they go on to explain the gospel. Or maybe it was, it was like I say, part of a song, or maybe it was a saying that the Christians passed around uh, among each other. Um, but whatever it was, it gives you a piece of what Christian life was like in the first century. That, that in a way, coming to Christ is like waking up. In a way, coming to Christ is like rising from the dead, just as Jesus did rise from the dead. And in a way, it's, it's, it's like Christ is shining on us and through us. In fact, in a, in a very real way, that's what it is. And so, if, if nothing else, maybe we can take that away with us this morning. It's nice and, and compact and concise. Wake up, sleepers, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Maybe that's the, the central focus of this time together this morning. But it's also, shining means it's a very purposeful life. 
So it says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. If it was true then, it's true now. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. All right? So it's a purposeful life. And it begins by saying that we should redeem the time. So what does redeeming mean? Redeeming means that something that once belonged to you, somebody else now has possession of and you want it back. How do you get it back? Well, you maybe buy it back or maybe you do something else to get it back. But it's called redemption, getting back what was once yours. So why does he say redeeming the time? He says that because God has given us a very precious gift of time. Every one of us has time. We don't know how much time we've been given, but every one of us has a certain number of days in this world. And when those days are done, then we go be with the Lord. That's it, you know, or, or, or other people, they go to, they go to judgment. But, but we have this gift of time. Now, you can fritter the time away. You can waste time. I remember very clearly as a child, I was sitting uh, doing homework and not really wanting to do the homework and wanting to do other things. And my mother comes by and says, you're wasting time. You know, you're wasting, you're, that's, that's cutting into your free time tonight. You wanna, you wanna waste your free time? You're, you're on the road to doing that, my friend. So let's get your homework done. Let's quit wasting time. Well, you know what? That's true about anything in life. We have been given time to walk with the Lord and serve the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that it's all business. Obviously, God ordained that the Israelites at least have a Sabbath, which means that on that day, no productive work was done. So God, God loves it when we relax and when we recharge and when we focus on him. It's, it's good. God loves it when we do legitimately, authentically good things to enjoy ourselves. He's not a, he's not a killjoy. But there, is, there are things we can do that waste time, that are counterproductive, that don't serve the Lord. And we're told, don't do that. Redeem the time. Make, make the most of every minute that you have to walk with the Lord and serve the Lord. Don't waste it on things that displease the Lord and that are not productive for his kingdom. So we are to redeem the time. We understand also God's will. So he says, understand God's will here. And you say, well, well, how do you do that? I mean, isn't that revealed in the word as well? And of course it is. But he's, he's giving us a hint of what that looks like in daily life in action. He says, instead of being drunk with wine, we should be filled with the Holy Spirit. So again, there's that contrast with what was common in the world at that time and obviously common today as well. Just as people are controlled by alcohol or drugs or whatever it is, it, it takes over it. It makes you do things you wouldn't normally choose to do. Instead of being controlled by those things, be controlled by the Holy Spirit and you will do things that you're not able to do by yourself. You will do amazing, godly, good things. Be filled with the Spirit. Okay, fine. But again, you ask the question, what does that look like? What does it look like to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I mean, even in the body of Christ, we have people emphasizing different things about what that looks like. You have some people saying being filled with the Spirit means that I understand this book better. Other people are saying, no, being filled with the Spirit means that God does amazing, miraculous things in my life. Well, here's what Paul says in this one passage. And I'm not saying that this is the only place where it, it, it tells us what it looks like, but it tells us three things about what being filled with the Spirit looks like here. It says, number one, it's a singing, joyful heart. And so I, I think we need to remember that, you know, at least in Protestant churches, we've always considered the main event to be the sermon. People come for the sermon. It's the main event. I, I want to challenge that. As, you know, I'm the one giving the sermon, but <laughs> I want to challenge that. The sermon is a part 
of Christian worship. But the worship part which precedes it is not just a preliminary. It is also a main event. Why? Because it's a way of worshiping God. It's, it's a way of lifting our hearts to God. And I think it's totally appropriate sometimes where we just come and we worship and there is no sermon because we've done what we came to do, which was honor the Lord in song. Something else about, about singing. Have you ever noticed that, um, that when you're in a bad mood and somebody comes along and they sing, a, they're singing or they're humming something and then that tune is in your head and you can't get it out of your head and somehow because that tune is kind of rumbling around in your head that somehow your, your mood changes? Music can change the way you feel. It can change the way you think. That's why on 4th of July we sing patriotic songs because we're, we're getting ourselves into the mood of patriotism. It's why when, when uh, we, we play, when we go to a wedding, you don't hear patriotic songs at a wedding. You hear love songs at a wedding because that's what that's about. And, and so songs and music have a way of changing the way our mind works and the way we're feeling about things. They can, they can generate emotions. And so if you want to be living a godly life with the right emotions and the right thinking, thinking then don't you want to sing? Don't you want to do the music and, and engender the music in your mind that would cause you to think the right way and to act the right way? So a joyful singing heart changes you. But it also, you know, it, it's a reflection of what's in us as well. If, if our hearts are full of the Lord, then song is going to come out of the mouth. And, and joy is going to come out of the life. So that's what being filled with the Holy Spirit looks like, at least in this passage. But also, a thankful attitude. How many people waste their time grumbling through life? Have you ever known anybody like that? Mr. or Mrs. Negative? Always got a comment to make, always a, a, a criticism. There's always something that's not quite right. The temperature's not right. The, the, it's, it's too much rain. It's not enough rain. Um, you know, there's, I, there's a story I told, I, I've heard told, and that is uh, there was this doctor who, who claimed that he could tell what a child was going to be when it grew up by just spending a half hour with it when, as an infant. So these parents thought, well, we'd like to know what our little boy would, is going to be when he grows up. So they took this child to the doctor. They dropped him off. And they came back after an hour or so of shopping and said, okay, doc, what's he going to be? He said, oh, he's going to be a farmer. Did nothing but cry the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no reflection on farmers, sorry. <laughs> but isn't it true? I mean, nothing's ever quite right. You know, too much rain, not enough rain. Uh, you know, this person didn't treat me right. You can spend your life, waste your life with grumbling and being discontent. Instead, be thankful, we're told, that in every, every situation, if Romans 8.28 is correct, that God works all things together for the good of those who love him or are called according to his purpose, then there's something to be thankful for in every situation. Even when you lost your job or lost a loved one or you were very ill or, or some disheartening thing happened, there's something that you can thank God about, that God, you saw me through that. God, I know you're with me. God, thank you for that kind person that came into my life and did something to make it a little better. Thank you, Lord, that there's always that thankful attitude. And then mutual submission. It leaves us at the end of this particular section with the command, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, which means I put you first. I, I put your interest before my interest. That's what submission means. And that then springboards us into the shining in marriage part of this. Okay, so before you get your rotten tomatoes out, <laughs> I am only reading what's in this passage. It says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, 
but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. All right, let's take this apart. A harmonious family life flows out of this command at the end of the last section, which says that we are to submit to one another. All Christians should submit to each other, meaning that I don't put myself above you. I don't put my interests before yours. I am here to make you better and you are here to make me better. So in marriage, what does that look like? It looks like wives should respect their husbands. So what does it not mean? It doesn't mean that wives are inferior. Clearly, if you read the rest of scripture, even the Old Testament, it never says that women are inferior. It also means that it doesn't mean that women are incompetent, that they're less capable somehow than their husbands. It does not mean that wives must mindlessly obey. It does mean that they must respect as to the Lord. Now, let's talk about that. So uh, some years ago, I was head of adult ministries in a large church. And one of my jobs was to vet the material that the adults were using in their Sunday school and their Bible studies and so on. So I had to read a lot of stuff. I had to, you know, be able to check out what this author or that, that piece of material, that book or whatever. One of the books that I had to, to check out was called Love and Respect. It was written about 20, maybe 25 years ago. Maybe you've read it. I, I thought it was a great book. I caught a little flack over it and it was kind of a silly thing, but... The, the, the main point of the book, as I understand it, is that what the author was trying to say was that the main, the main thing that men are hoping to get from their wives is respect. And the main thing that wives are hoping to get from their husbands is love. Now, you can poke a lot of holes in that. You can make a lot of exceptions to that, of course. But I think the main point is probably biblically valid. And um, the, 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 the flack that I caught was because the author wasn't very careful in how he said it. He said, the deepest need for a man is respect and the deepest need for a woman is love. And of course, the, the flack came from somebody who said, no, our deepest need is for Christ. And of course, it's for Christ. But I think in marriage, in the relationship, what the author was trying to say is, women want love and men want respect. And so let's take that for just a minute. A wife should respect her husband. Now think about it. What if he doesn't deserve respect? That's a fair question. Because I've met guys who don't deserve respect. I wouldn't respect them. Why would I expect his wife to respect him? That's a fair question. And it's, it's something that happens, sadly, far too often. Is she off the hook? And the answer is no. Because it's not, in this passage, it is not dependent upon what kind of man he is. It's dependent upon his position. And the degree to which she can respect her husband because of the position he's in, representing Christ, is the degree to which she actually does respect Christ. If she doesn't respect her husband, if she can't at least respect him for the position that he holds, then it's questionable how, how much she understands of her Christian faith. So that's very clear there, and it doesn't need a lot of explanation. It's very short. The husband's section is much longer because guys are denser than women, and they need a little more explanation. It says here, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. All right, so what does that mean? It does not mean having a sentimental feeling all the time. Now, guys, if you remember, I don't know how you were. To me, I didn't have any feelings when I stood at the altar with that woman down there some years ago. I was numb. I was kind of in la-la land. In fact, I was asking myself, what have I done? Because it's a scary thing. Not that I didn't want to be married to her, I did. But I, I, had, I was just scared to death as to what I was getting into. But some guys stand up there and they're just full of gushy, lovey feeling, and that's the way it should be. 
at your wedding. But let's not fool ourselves. The gushy, lovey feeling comes and goes. Because as beautiful as she was on the wedding day, there are going to be days in which she's not at her best. And she may not be the raving beauty that you married on that particular occasion. So the, the, the loving feelings come and go. But what, is it, what does love mean? It means that you love her in the same way that Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Twice in this chapter it tells us that he died for her. He gave himself up for her. He sacrificed himself for her. That's what love is all about. And that never changes. Feelings come and go. The, the, the act of love never changes. She, you're always there to make her better. You're always there to benefit her. You're always there to serve her, her legitimate interests. You're always there to make sure that she gets served first before you do. That is how you love your wife. And you know, the funny thing about that is, the more you act that way, the more the feelings come back. The more the feelings show up. You know, the, the feelings are generated by the action. It's always that way. Have you ever noticed that, you know, you're mad at somebody, it doesn't have to be your husband or your wife, but you're mad at somebody and you're, you, know, you know exactly what you're gonna tell them next time you see them. And then they come and, and they act lovingly towards you and of course you're, you're trying to follow suit and you, you also, you know, do the right thing by them and, and your anger disappears, doggone it. And you end up, feeling better about them. Why is that? Because action generates feelings. And husbands, we are commanded to love our wives. But guys need a little more explanation. So there's a further explanation. It gives us some, some reasons. Number one, it tells us that it's in the husband's own interest to do this. That you're, you're just shooting yourself in the foot if you don't. You're cutting your own throat if you don't. Why? Because she's part of you. And you don't love her, you don't love yourself, is what it says. You, you mistreat her, you're mistreating yourself. Why would you do that? Why would you mistreat this person who has joined herself to you and is now part of you? It doesn't make any logical sense. Do it, if for no other reason than for your own sake, is what it's saying there. And secondly, it says that you're painting a picture to the world of what Christ's attitude is like towards his church. If they see you loving your wife like Christ loved the church, it's only going to add weight to the good news that they can have if they trust in Jesus Christ. And if you are not loving your wife, you are, you are, you are denying the truth that Jesus Christ loves his church. In fact, to the degree that you love your wife is the degree to which you understand what Christ has done for you. And to the degree that you don't love your wife means you don't get it. No matter what words you say, you don't get it. So if anything, I think the husband's job is at least as hard, if not harder, than the wife's job. And when we do this, we represent Jesus well. We shine for Jesus in our lives and in our marriages. So we are called to spread Christ's life in our, light in our community. What's that look like? Well, as the world around us is dark, we are going to be the light on the hill, as we have been for many years. But we're going to continue to be this shining light where, where people are saying, I, I don't know how to live. I don't know what the alternatives are. And they meet some of us and they say, well, at least they seem to have something. They, they seem to be attractive. They, they're doing something right. And they come to our church and they experience something like this where, where there's great worship and, and, and there's truth being proclaimed and there's love being shared. And, and, and they say, I want that. I, I don't know exactly what it's all about, but I want that. So in our personal lives as we go about our business and in our life together as, as a church family, we will shine the light in this dark time. And as we do that, people will be drawn to Jesus Christ through our kids' programs, through our Bible studies, through our men's and women's ministries, through our church services and through our individual witness for Jesus Christ on this mountain and across the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to shine for you. Lord, we, we didn't seek you. I know I didn't, but you sought us and found us. And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you for, I don't know, saving us before we walked off a cliff. 
And Lord, we just, we're so grateful that we get to serve you. Lord, help us to do that, right? Lord, we, we wanna leave this place determined to be used by you, to find what pleases you. And then, Lord, we know that you're gonna draw people to yourself through this and, and that you're going to enhance our own community life uh, as the body of Christ. So, Lord, we, we know that you're gonna do it. We believe you, we trust you, and we promise to follow you in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Michael. That was great. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to sing uh, God So Love one more time. And then uh, remember to stick around, uh, especially if you're a member, because we're going to have an important vote after this.
Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. God bless you guys. Enjoy that beautiful day. Enjoy the presence of the Lord. Take him with you. And uh, if you are a member, please stick around and, and uh, make sure you place your vote. We want to know what you think. And we love you. So have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday. Don't forget your signs. We, want, we don't want any signs here today. We're running out of time. We want to, we want to see them around the neighborhoods and stuff. So come and get one if there's any left.